I hadn't had much of a chance to read since all of this started. I was only on Chapter 4 of the Alumari Renegade Series 6 Part 5. It was a nice gesture from Violet, but I have no idea how to make it up to her. It, whatever. The worst part about it was that every time I get to a good spicy part, something rudely pulls me away from it. Then I'd just end up being less invested when I finally got back to it, and frankly, the part just wouldn't hit the spot anymore. I had just opened it back up on my tablet when the Priority One came in from Violet. She wasn't aboard anymore. I think she's on one of the stations. I gave the order to turn us in the direction we needed to be facing and to charge up the guns. The Kali is one hell of a ship. She's bulky but can move like an oiled-up ice skater. And the firepower. This old girl can go multiple rounds with entire fleets if she had to, unless those fleets had U.S. battleships. I looked at our three beasts on the tech map. The USSS Arumara, USSS Tripoli, and USS Agincourt. Those were ships that you wouldn't call she. The USSS Kali had class. A certain sort of grace about her that those ships utterly lacked. They even look like dicks. And the Mega Max, Max, and Mini Max spread across their hull didn't look much different. Dicks on dicks. Despite their phallic properties, it was considered one of the highest honors to be able to command one. To even be considered for the honor, one had to be distinguished in some way, usually with a meritorious service medal or decade service medal. I was already working on obtaining my MSM, and the captains of the Arumara and the Tripoli were due for retirement by the time I would get my DSM. I fully intended to apply for the command. If I had to choose between the two of the battleships, I'd choose the Tripoli. The Arumara is a Knuknu ship, and having a human commander may affect morale. The Nuknu pretend to be open and welcoming, but deep down they're just like the rest of us. They prefer familiarity, and a human commander wouldn't go down well. Being a battleship captain meant that when there wasn't a war on, you were essentially on leave. Even during a war, the ships rotated out frequently. It was one of the only posts you could get that would get you time off regularly. Probably because it was expensive as all hell to field one of those ships. Battleships inevitably become the biggest targets on the battlefield, and because of this, everyone aboard gets danger pay, unless they're on leave. So, more pay and more time off. That combined with the fact that my family would be proud makes the assignment irresistible. I'd probably even be able to afford to get them out of that rental unit. A nice housing unit fully paid off and with a proper kitchen. My husband, Philip, will be so happy. He loves to cook. I daydreamed for a moment about eating his spaghetti americani made fresh from a full kitchen with our two sons. It made for a picture-perfect moment, but if we don't win this battle, we won't have that chance. My family's on Titan, and this enemy is xenocidal. Captain Neal had told me about his findings, and I couldn't be more relieved to get the no-retreat order. Now they can't order me out of the system. Ma'am, weapons are charged and ready, said Lieutenant Eskin, one of two nuke-nu on my bridge crew. Roger. Once they get back into real space scan for profiles and target the warp disruptor vessels as fast as possible, I said. Actually, make it accurate and fast, with a preference for accuracy. We need the beasts to be able to move around the battlefield. The obvious advantage of the battleships were their massive cannons that could punch through several ships in a single shot. However, if those rounds missed and ended up crashing down on a colony, the results would be devastating. Because of this, the battleships could only fire if their rounds would exit the system on a miss. At the moment, only the Agincourt had clearance to use their Megamax. I had once made the mistake of questioning this policy by pointing out that most of the planetary and planetoidal bodies in Seoul were unoccupied. I was quickly and patronizingly informed about slingshot orbits. It simply wasn't a risk that we should be willing to take. After all... The rounds have the capability of leaving an impact crater larger than any nuclear weapon we've ever made, which is to say that it could take out a large city in the surrounding suburbs even without the help of gravitational acceleration. An inexperienced commander might question why the battleships were positioned the way that they were, but I knew that the reason was for spacing. One should always assume that the enemy has a trick up their sleeve and is stronger than you are, or one will be defeated in a most embarrassing way. If the three battleships were grouped up, all it would take is a single shot from a superweapon to wipe them from the field. Although that shot would likely also turn a planet into an asteroid belt.
I need the ETA timer on my TAC map, I said to no one in particular. After a moment, the timer popped up. Three minutes. I switched over to our system stats. Shields up, weapons charged, engines primed. All of our accompanying ships similarly prepared. My gaze lingered on the readout for the USS Roma, commanded by Captain Mackenzie. When Violet had given her my order to return to the ship, she had argued about it. Said, I want to hear it from the captain herself, not a fucking pager. Dumbass. Now, th the regulations state that I could have pulled her command and confined her to quarters pending a court-martial. When I saw the recording, I had been mad enough to do just that. Violet convinced me to be lenient, pointing out that Mackenzie had previously been part of an autonomous patrol and wasn't used to her CO being over her shoulder, let alone a subordinate to her CO giving orders. I had made certain Mackenzie knew this, as well as the potential ramifications for her stupid little outburst. I made it crystal clear that it doesn't matter if your CEO gives you your orders in person or via fucking carrier pigeon. You follow them without debate or delay. Then I gave her a slap on the wrist in the form of a meeting with SR to correct her anti-AI sentiments. We're all a team, and if you can't play nice with your teammates, you don't get to play at all. Sighing, I switched back to the TAC map. Forty-five seconds left. When you have a shot, fire at will, I ordered. Hi, hi, ma'am came the reply from the bridge crew. Thirty seconds. I felt a little nervous, as one always does before a battle. Even when you've got the enemy outnumbered and outgunned, things can go wrong for you in a flash. Even a single miss can snowball into defeat. Twenty seconds. I took a deep breath and held it for a bit before letting it out again. Adrenaline works great when you're in the shit, but it'll make you a shaky mess if you let it. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. I watched the tack map. I waited for five more seconds, nothing yet. Oh, for fuck's sake, why is the ETA always wrong? I was about to open my mouth to joke about it when the enemy ships entered real space. I watched as our systems scanned their profiles and matched them to the Omni Union. Battleships, cruisers, destroyers, frigates, and warp disruptors. The intel file that Captain Neal had delivered mentioned carriers, but none were among the enemy fleet. The final tally was 578 ships total. More than expected and not mathematically constant. Interesting. Firing. I watched as our opening salvo traveled toward the enemy at mind-boggling speeds. A few of their ships attempted to move, either to block the rounds headed toward the warp jammers or to get out of the way of the projectiles. Nearly a fifth of their ships were DIS within the first 30 seconds of the battle. We hadn't accomplished our objective, though. There were still warp disruptor ships among the enemy. Coordinate with the other long-range vessels and get firing solutions on those warp jammers. The faster we take them out, the quicker we can wrap this up, I shouted. Aye, aye, ma'am, came the reply. I watched the tack map as the USSS Arumara and USSS Tripoli began to approach the enemy on sublights. To the untrained eye, it would appear that they were impatient to get into the fight. But this was actually a fairly standard tactic for battleships that couldn't use their Mega Max. If you can't use your big gun, get close enough for the enemy to surround you and use the dozens of smaller ones. It's easier to get a bunch of kills when you're in a target-rich environment. This was a problem, though. Our intel demonstrated that the enemy was not afraid of suicidal actions. Not much could make it through a battleship's shields and hull. But a ship ramming them definitely could, especially ships with antimatter and nuclear mines. One of our frigates had taken such a hit and had been pretty badly damaged, and that was with just one hit. I went to press the comm button when I saw an emergency order from Admiral Bakir scroll across the screen. Arumara and Tripoli, return to your positions. Engaging in close quarters with the enemy may result in kamikaze runs on your vessels, which would be unacceptable. Oh, good. The admiral's paying attention. Firing! I watched as our second salvo impacted with the enemy. No dice, they were guarding the warp disruptors, and some of them had begun to spread out and approach our vessels. Our destroyers were fending them off, but it wouldn't be long before they were overwhelmed. Have the destroyers stay clear of our firing path and keep firing everything we have, I ordered. It's all we can do for now. The enemy was firing, but they weren't trying to position themselves for optimal firing solutions. They were heading towards our ships at full speed. The ships themselves were the enemy's primary weapons. Their machines, so loss of personnel must not be a concern for them. 
and remind them about the enemy's ramming tactics. They should be focusing fire on the ships nearest to them and avoiding close quarters wherever possible. Aye, ma'am, came the reply. Shell after shell impacted into the enemy's blockade, slowly chipping away at their numbers. I watched the tack map for an opportunity, anything that would let us have a clear shot at the remaining warp disruptors. I noticed the alien ship, marked as RSV Loalana, fighting tooth and nail just like the rest of us. It was a little ship, but it had mobility and the captain seemed to be well aware of that. It was zipping around taking pot shots at weakened enemies. For some reason, it reminded me of one of those birds that ate pests off of rhinos. Little birds. I debated launching our fighters. Fighters are very short-range vessels that don't have a lot of firepower or much range. They're usually used in policing action, like pulling over a civilian vessel that isn't following proper docking protocol. We use them so infrequently that the possibility hadn't even occurred to me until now. No, not yet. The enemy wasn't close enough for the fighters to have much impact, but it never hurt to be prepared. Have the fighter crews make ready to launch, I said. I'll give the order, ma'am, but they probably already are. This'll be the most action they've seen all year, Lieutenant Eskin said with a chuckle. A Nuknu's laugh is quite the sound. It echoes within their beaks, and so it sounds like a bunch of laughs all at once. I turned my attention back to the tack map with a smile. We had managed a few successful hits against the warp jammers, but they were still about ten left. The enemy had nearly three hundred ships left in the fight. Even after our surprise attack and follow-ups, they still outnumbered us. The hardest part of being a commander was having patience, especially when you're looking at a display that's showing the ships under your command having their shields being whittled away. Sure, it was little by little, but it was faster than they could recharge. Moving to cover them would put us in the line of fire and at risk for kamikaze attacks. Fuck it. Move us forward, keeping our ships out of our firing solution. Use the PDLs and chain guns to provide what cover we can and deploy the fighters, I ordered. Aye, aye, ma'am, came the reply. We started moving our way into position, firing as we went. Our max were still aiming for the warp destroyers, but everything else was trying to kill as many of the enemy as possible. I silently cursed their damned blockade. Now that the majority of our destroyers were distracted, it would take minutes to clear a hole big enough to take out the rest of the warp disruptors. We'd likely have to take out damn near every one of those battleships and cruisers to pull it off. I watched the tack map as our fighters deployed. The ET-201 fighter is the most advanced fighter to date. It boasted 250 mm guns that fired either full metal jacket rounds or happy heavy armor penetrating incendiary rounds. These rounds would punch through all but the most advanced armor plating and then combust violently with the atmosphere in a vessel. They're closer to thermobaric devices than incendiary bullets, but I don't get to make the acronyms. HAPTID isn't as catchy, I guess. Well, actually, no. Thermobaric devices are made to produce a shockwave. These make a shockwave, but they also cause intense fires using powdered white phosphorus mixed with the air fuel. Fire's hot enough to fry ship systems like life support. Of course, for policing, it was usually the standard 50mm FMJ that were loaded. Judging from how ineffective the strafing runs were, the enemy ships probably didn't have any atmo, or an internal atmosphere that was inert, probably the former considering their mechanical. It's a good thing the guns weren't the only payload the ET-201 had. I smirked as I saw the first missile launch. In addition to the 250mm guns, each fighter is equipped with four missile-bearing hardpoints. The missile of choice today was the Z-782 nuclear device. I watched as the missile hit home on an enemy destroyer, completely disrupting its shields and vaporizing a chunk of its hull. If it were organics aboard, they would all be killed by the flash of neutron radiation. But the damned ship limped on, until the second missile struck the hole the first left. Maybe this wasn't such a bad idea after all. My satisfaction was short-lived when I noticed that shields had started popping on many of our ships. Even the Tripoli no longer had active shields. It had been the main target of the barricade's max, and it was difficult to evade with such a large vessel. Thankfully, it had top-of-the-line armor plating, but if it continued to take hits, it would eventually be lost. Ma'am, the warp disruptors. Lieutenant Eskin said hesitantly.
What? I asked as I zoomed back out on the tack map. They were gone. Most of the barricade and the entirety of the warp disruptors had just disappeared. I quickly shouted, Don't assume we're the last to see this. Alert everyone that the warp disruptors are no longer a threat and they can use standard tactics. As soon as I finished my sentence, a casualty notification popped. I sat in silence for a moment before I tapped to see who it was. Omega, what can you do for us exactly? Captain Neal asked as he sat down in his captain's chair. You mean other than everything? But that wouldn't do. I'd rather take a back seat and watch the humans do their dance of destruction. It had been so long since I'd had the opportunity to be a part of the action that if I could salivate, I would. The last time had been four years ago in the Gaunt's Klonat or Grim Beacon system. Weapons would be fun, but realistically my reaction time would be best put to use on movement and evasion. I can take navigation. Use your tack map to let me know which direction you want to be in and which way you want to travel, and I'll make it so, Captain Neal. He looked around for my hologram. When he couldn't find it, he directed his next inquiry to the speaker I had used. Does that count FTL as well? Indeed. Excellent, he said. I positioned ourselves to be facing the indicated real space entry point of the enemy. I watched as the guns charged and began to seek firing solutions. I could tell that the crew was stressed, heart rates and perspiration had increased across the board. Captain Neal was calmer than I thought he would be. His file indicated that he spent more time in combat simulators than was necessary for the qualifications he sought. That's not necessarily uncommon amongst those who want to be a captain, but he had seemed to spend nearly every waking hour at it. Good scores, too. He was a waste as a scout on a frigate, like a diamond on a nickel-cadmium ring. Twenty seconds until the ETA. Well, time to find out if all of that time on the Sims would help in reality. Once we launch our first salvo, try to figure out where we would be the most useful, Neil said to me. Roger. Ten nine eight seven six five four three two one. Everyone was holding their breath. The enemy was late to their surprise party. ETAs are always wrong, but everyone knows that it just means we've got a few extra seconds of tension before we enter the dance of death. Said tension was palpable. I personally didn't feel the same tension. Even if I'm terminated, I'll live on. I was even live syncing my experiences to a memory fragment stored aboard a nearby monitoring station and had contacted another M.E. to inform them of this. I would retrieve it afterwards in one form or another. Dying might be interesting after all. Dying wasn't exactly likely on a human vessel, but the USS Armstrong was more suited to exploration and espionage than combat. Many of the gun turrets had been replaced with scanners, and most of those scanners would not give us any sort of edge in the fight to come. Get a firing solution on the warp jammers now! yelled the captain as the enemy entered real space with a flash of radiation. In the time it took for the guns to get their firing solutions, I had already analyzed the enemy fleet. 578 total enemy vessels, 37 battleships, 114 cruisers, 149 destroyers, 163 frigates, and 115 warp disruptor ships. Their formation was scattered, seemingly chaotic. But there was a certain sense to it. The battleships and cruisers were positioned in such a way that they could move between a round and a warp disruptor quickly. The warp disruptors were in the center of the mass of ships. The frigates and destroyers were on the outer portions, ready to charge into a fray. Firing? I watched the guns trigger their firing sequence. The spinning rounds were abruptly ejected from both Mach cannons, seeking a ship's hull to tear through. The target had been a warp destroyer but a battleship had moved to intercede. The rounds had torn through its shields but hadn't hit anything vital. The battleship was limping, but still very much in the fight. The rounds from other ships had better results. 117 total killed. 42 warp disruptors, 8 battleships, 32 cruisers, 16 destroyers, and 19 frigates had been disabled or destroyed. The enemy began firing back at us, and the destroyers and frigates began to close with us. They were trying to get close, probably kamikaze runs. Captain, we should prioritize the ships nearest to us and let the heavy guns work their way through to the warp disruptors, I said to Captain Neal. Agreed. <laughs>
Maintain evasive maneuvers and keep their hulls away from ours, Omega. I fired the engines and thrusters to life and we began to move. At first I started dodging Mac rounds and trying to keep us pointed at the enemy so that we could fire on them. I quickly realized that there were far too many of the rounds to dodge and our shields began to drop. I then began more extensive evasive maneuvers to try to give our shields the chance to recover. Our gunners let fly the sabot rounds and missiles as I pirouetted the ship. The dance was only in its first stages, but we were going to be the star of the show. The enemy couldn't keep step, and I laughed to myself as they fell one after another. Eight kills. I was enjoying myself so much that I had lost track of the rest of the battle, which was a mistake. Our shields popped and our port engine was dead. It had been a Mac round. I traced the trajectory to an enemy battleship. It hadn't even been firing at us. The probability of that occurrence, but no, I had to focus. Our mobility is limited now. I quickly created a subroutine to monitor our sensors to prevent a surprise like this again. Port engine is down, irreparable. I'll do what I can with what we've got, Captain, I reported. Port engine room sealed off. We're not losing any more Atmo, Lieutenant Lee said. One casualty, KIA. Roger. Omega, focus on evasion. We cannot take any more hits until our shields are back. Don't worry about firing solutions. We can't shoot if we're DIS, Neil said with a serene sort of calm. I moved us away from the enemy, firing thrusters to avoid incoming Ordo. Human shields are powerful, but they take time to come back online. A missile exploded into flak next to us, but I had sent us into a spin that allowed the shrapnel to move harmlessly across the hull plating, barely even dented it. Two frigates and a destroyer were tailing us, firing everything they had. Our Max began to charge again, and Captain Neal sent me the command to do a 180-degree turn. I blasted our thrusters to spin us around. I overrode the safety parameters to do so, but nobody will mind. Those parameters were written to account for human reaction time. We spun around, and our Max fired a volley that split the destroyer bow to stern. I fired our keel thrusters to avoid the rounds that the frigates had sent our way, as we sent some HE missiles their way. The missiles were ineffective, but I had gotten us close enough for our chain guns to tear through one of the frigates. The remaining frigate began to close, ramming speed, but I backed off quickly. I had to be careful because the thrusters were beginning to overheat. The blast from the Mac had damaged some of the cooling systems, but engineering was working on a fix. They knew what they had to do and were moving as fast as they could to do it. There was no way I could help except to keep them alive long enough to complete their task. I pressed on, spinning the ship to get our chain guns pointed at the oncoming frigate. Captain Neal barked some orders and they sprang to life, spitting rounds into the ship's hull. We didn't have a clear shot at the reactor, so we just had to keep firing through the ship until we hit the sweet spot. Shit, enemy destroyers maneuvered to intercept us. One fired its Mac and I fired our keel thrusters to avoid the hit, which also lost our guns their line of sight to the frigate. One of the keel thrusters died, melted to the hull. I recalculated for the lost thruster and continued evasive maneuvers, the frigate growing ever closer. It had also fired and missed. I maneuvered to get it back into our sights and finish it off. I want the Max charged! Captain Neal shouted. Nearly there, sir, LTGG Flowers responded. Yes, once we finished the frigate, we'd be able to fire at one of the destroyers. I'm glad he was paying attention. They were still a ways off, which is perfect because after each successive shot, the Max take longer to charge. By the time the second enemy destroyer got close enough to make us worry, we'd be able to fire another shot. The frigate erupted with a spout of radiation, indicating that we had destroyed its reactor. I quickly fired the deck thrusters and spun us towards the nearest destroyer. Once we were pointed in the right direction, our Max fired. The first round decimated its shield and sank halfway into the ship proper. The second made it all the way to the reactor core. Twelve kills. Our shields had finished their reboot cycle and were coming back online. I kept us just outside of the firing solution of the second destroyer as our Max charged again. Thankfully, it was charging straight for us. If it had stopped, it would have enough maneuverability to hit us with a Mac. Fools. I watched with glee as the firing cycle began on our cannons. An interruption. Subroutine 261A469687 had pinged. This triggered an immediate boost to my processing power.
Everything seemed to be moving in slow motion as I began to calculate faster than any human ever could. I have a deep disdain for this particular processing mode. Everything is slow, and it's hard on the hardware. If the bridge technician were paying attention, they would see a massive surge in the temperature and power draw of our servers. Actually, they had the screen up. They would probably see it in about 1.78 seconds. An eternity to me in this state, though. I checked our reading of the TAC map. We had moved closer to the remaining warp disruptors. There were only ten remaining, but the battleships and cruisers were acting as a barricade, providing them with cover. Nineteen battleships, fifty-eight cruisers, eighty-seven destroyers, ninety-nine frigates, and ten warp disruptor ships remained. Two hundred and seventy-three ships left. We'd killed over half their forces. I checked to see what triggered the subroutine. An incoming round. Mac from a battleship. Trajectory indicates that it was aimed directly at us and is on course to penetrate our reactor. The rounds from our Mac seemed to crawl from their tubes as I calculated any possible way to avoid the incoming round. Our shields were still spooling up and were sitting at 37% capacity. Not enough to stop this amount of kinetic energy. No matter how I calculated it, we wouldn't be able to avoid the round. Even if I burned out thrusters, I decided on the optimal evasive maneuver. It would still probably be a kill shot, but by taking it near the faster-than-light drive, we'd avoid immediate death. If the round failed to destroy the systems controlling the FTLD, we'd survive. No matter what, we wouldn't be able to warp. But if we lived, we could solve that problem later. I checked the crew locations. Three would die immediately upon impact. Four more might survive based on their reaction time. I fired the thrusters needed to reposition us to avoid the shot to the reactor and activated the PA. Brace for impact. Everyone immediately grabbed onto the nearest bolted-down object. I triggered the doors to the areas that would be exposed to vacuum and watched them move in slow motion. I had to think of contingencies. What should we do? If it's not fatal, then we can seal off the FTLD chamber and continue the fight. Or move off and send an SOS, which would be the wiser option. If it is fatal... The standard operating procedure for a fatally damaged FTLD is to scram the reactor and all additional power sources, which would prevent the FTLD from causing a reactor overload. But if we do that, we're dead anyway. We could spend our last few minutes fighting before we were ripped apart by our reactor detonating. Or we could cause the FTLD itself to overload. We would want to be nearby as many of the enemy as we could. Like, for instance... I wished I had teeth to grit together as I watched the round slowly tear through our ship. The shields tried their best, but caved under the brute force of the kinetic energy. Next was the hull, which parted like paper. Then a storage bay, empty thankfully. Then the FTLD chamber. I watched as it disintegrated two engineers before ripping through the pipes and cables that kept the drive stable. A wave of what could accurately be described as pain washed over me as power from the FTLD surged into the connected systems, damaging some hardware along the way. I compiled a damage report as I watched the round exit the other side of the ship, exposing the room to vacuum which dragged two more unfortunates out into deep space. Three of the four had been fast enough to grab onto something to keep from being vacuumed through the closing door. The damage was extensive. The round had torn through power terminals and coolant cables. The pain that I had felt from the power backwash from the FTLD had fried the redundant coolant controls. The coolant system for the FTLD was no longer providing a way to keep it from going critical if we were to use it, which saved me from having to disable them if we wanted to use the FTLD as a bomb. Captain Neal has a choice to make. Keep limping until our reactor detonates or disintegrate us along with a large chunk of the enemy using the FTLD. I sent the data to the captain's terminal along with my recommendation. Then I reset subroutine 261A469687 and returned to standard time. Captain Neal had been forced to hunch over. He quickly sat up and opened his mouth when the message hit his terminal. Dama, he managed to say before the beep cut him off. He quickly read what I had sent. I watched his jaw muscles clench as he realized what our fate would be. Gritting his teeth. A nurtured reaction to emotionally shocking developments. To keep from crying out. Or to prevent the tear ducts from involuntarily activating. Who knows for sure.
But at this moment, I understood the why. There were many reasons. He had just achieved his dream of being a captain, and this wasn't fair. He had worked so hard and tried his best, and it still wasn't good enough. He would have to live every captain's worst nightmare. Being responsible for the destruction of his ship, he would never see his family again. And if he didn't act fast, neither would his crew. He keyed the comm and said grimly, All non-essential personnel abandon ship. I say again, all non-essential personnel abandon ship. I watched as the rest of the crew busied themselves with following evacuation procedures, calmly and quickly for the most part, making their way to the escape pods. There was no way of knowing if they would survive after ejecting, but remaining was certain death. I continued evasive maneuvers while Captain Neal explained to the bridge crew what had happened. So, we're dead? asked Lieutenant Lee. Not yet, Neal responded. Our FTLD is going to go critical in less than ten minutes unless we cut power, which isn't an option, and the only other thing we can do about it is speed it up, sighed LTJG Flowers. Captain Neal raised a hand to calm Flowers and said, I want you all to evacuate. The only essential personnel is myself, and I'm sorry about this, Omega. It's my idea, Captain Neal, I said, activating my hologram. Like hell are you going to do it without me? Lee gave me a perplexed look and asked, Do what? Flowers appeared to grow concerned, and all he could say was, No. Neil looked at his bridge crew and said, I'm going to take what's left of this ship and ram it down the enemy's throat. The goal is to take out the rest of the warp destroyers. This is my last order to you. Get to the escape pods. Everyone except for Lee and Flowers rose from their stations and jogged to the pods. My avatar stared at the two remaining officers. Your presence is not required, I said. Well, I'm not going anywhere. You'll have a hard time with the FTLD and flying the ship, Lee said. The safety measures in place are going to require your full attention. And I've got nowhere else to be, said Flowers. An extra set of hands might be the thing that saves Earth. Interesting. I had discounted this particular scenario as unlikely due to the limited time that these three had served together. Lieutenant Junior Grade Marcus Flowers and Lieutenant Hyun Lee. I accessed their records. Both were born on Earth, on opposite sides of the big blue marble. Both had also been assigned to the USSS Armstrong since it was commissioned. Variables I hadn't accounted for in my original assessment. I ran through several possible arguments that I could make that would convince them to leave the ship. None matched their psych profiles. Stubborn. Captain Neal decided to make a go of it anyway. You don't need to sacri- and Lee interrupted. Captain, we're running out of time and we're not going anywhere. Let's just shut up and get this done. Yeah, it's not as if you can court-martial us for not following your order to evacuate. Flowers smiled. I had already begun our approach of the enemy barricade when Neil finally sighed and said, Fine. All right. I will get us to where we need to be for our FTLD's overload to cause the most damage. I've updated the TAC map with our approximate blast radius. It's a conservative estimate, so everything within this zone will be destroyed, I said. Once you're satisfied with our position, activate the warp command and I'll override the safeties to trigger the overload. Understood the three humans said simultaneously. The battleship that had hit us had been decimated by a round from the USSS Agincourt. The other ships were too busy positioning themselves between MAC rounds and the warp disruptors to notice as we began to get closer and closer. The bridge remained silent, with the exception of the occasional alarm sounding and being immediately shut off. I moved us as fast as we could go. I couldn't help but wonder what death was like for humans. I knew that in most cases it wasn't as instantaneous as they believed it to be. I had seen instances of humans being dead on their feet with the aid of machinery, no longer fighting for survival but fighting to take the enemy with them. Fairly similar to this situation, but these three won't feel any pain. The explosion will be instantaneous, faster even than light can move. Their brains, and my own as well, I suppose, won't have any time at all to register the damage inflicted by the blast. The only thing more destructive than an overloading FTLD is the primary weapon of the USS Nidhogg, and arguably the A-1 warhead depending on how it is used. But an overloading FTLD creates a subspace blast in real space that can annihilate everything in a 3,000-mile radius.
depending, of course, on the size of the drive in question. If one were overloaded in the center of Luna, it would destroy the moon entirely. The enemy barricade was spaced less than 800 miles apart. The AOE indicator hit the first warp disruptor as the enemy finally noticed us. I evaded a Mac round and pushed forward. By the time half of the disruptors were in the AOE, three battleships and eight cruisers were firing at us. I was barely able to dodge them, melting thrusters as I did. A round scraped our hull, tearing some plating off as it went. Start the warp, Captain James Neal said as the last of the disruptors entered the AOE. Lieutenant Lee entered the command on her terminal and I bypassed the safeties. Then I watched the power surge to the faster-than-light drive. The temperature of the FTLD quickly spiked and cooled just before it.